New York was a city in continuous convulsion, Baghdad on the subway, one writer called it. It was the urban frontier, more real to most Americans than the vanished frontier out west. The painter who led the depiction of this tough, exuberant city was a son of a riverboat gambler who'd killed a man in Nebraska and fled east. His name was Robert Henry. He'd learned about realism at the Philadelphia Academy and in Paris. He was a charismatic teacher and he'd acquired a circle of younger artists who were as committed as he was to painting the human clay, the streets and slums of New York. There is only one reason for art in America, he said, and that is that the people of America learn the means of expressing themselves in their own time and their own land. Because of their desire to tell some truths about the dirty city, Henry's group was nicknamed the Ashcan School. They spurned academic painting. They disliked Impressionism as an art of mere surfaces. Henry wanted art to be akin to journalism. He wanted paint to be as real as mud, as the clods of horseshit and snow that froze on Broadway in the winter as real a human product as sweat, carrying the unsuppressed smell of human life. Idealism he scoffed at. Another colloquial artist was George Bellows. His views of the excavation for Pennsylvania Station show a grand canyon in the city, with late snow still on the floor of the crater. Steam and smoke billow up from the engines below. This is a view of the city as precipitous, dizzying. Forty-two kids depict the pale, gawky, knobbly bodies of working-class boys horsing around by the Hudson River on what was called Splinter Beach, a broken-down wooden pier. But Bellow's fascination with low life and high testosterone found its main subject in the prize fights that were held in semi-clandestine New York clubs with the ferocity of gang warfare. Prize fighting was illegal in New York, but that did nothing to stop it. And for Bellows, as for Hemingway and Norman Mailer later, it was a prime metaphor of manliness and survival, war in a smoky room. In Stag at Sharkey's, the boxers form an arch joined only at their heads. The faces are bloody speed blurs, the pigment fat and vivid, the bodies starkly gleaming. Along the ringside are the heads of the spectators that put you in mind of Daumier. The most lyrical and politically the most acerbic of the Ashcan artists was John Sloan, a spectator of life, as he called himself, looking at a less violent world than Bellows. In election night, he sets down a more benign crowd, a throbbing, chaotic bunch of New Yorkers making whoopee under the elevated railway. Sloan's work had an honest humaneness, a frank sympathy. He refused to flatten lower-class New Yorkers into stereotypes of misery. It is the poor who emigrate, and the poor don't bring Titians with them. But in America, the immigrants created a new popular culture the folk art of the urban crowd. Its great instrument was the silent movie, which crossed all the barriers of language and spoke to every level of the American Tower of Babel precisely because it was silent. Its supreme exponent was Charlie Chaplin, an emigrant from the East End of London. Chaplin's tramp enacts the difficulties and humiliations of the immigrant underdog. The constant struggle at the bottom of the American heap, 
and yet he triumphs over adversity without ever rising to the top, thereby staying in touch with his audience. Chaplin's films were also deliciously subversive. The bumbling officials enable the immigrants to laugh at those they fear. But because silent cinema was entertainment and not art, people didn't resist it. It largely escaped controversy. It changed the perceptions of a whole society, but it was tolerated and welcomed. Painting and sculpture, high art, were a different matter. Not many Americans cared about changes in their language, but those who did care saw modernism as a threat to civilization itself.